And welcome, everybody, uh, to this uh, Wednesday, June 1, 2016 edition of TNZ Talk, June 1st already. I am Tony Truppiano, the T in TNZ. I've been doing radio uh, for the most uh, part of the last 24 years, and I'm joined by the professor himself, the brilliant writer for the Huffington Post and Liberals Unite, the Z in T and Z, Richard Zombach. Professor, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good, good morning. Bonjour. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe we Buenos should. Dias. You know, I, 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 never mind. I won't say it. Anyway, bon dia. no. Nah, that's not what I was going to say, <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll we'll leave it alone. Uh, listen, we uh, we've been off for a few days, and so wanted to wish you a belated happy Memorial Day, and and hope you had a nice weekend. Although you really do keep busy on the quote unquote traditional off days. Uh, yeah, I had a I had a pretty busy day. I, I drove up to Maine. I took my parents to the bus station so that they could go to the airport. Um, they insist on me not taking them to the. So don't anybody tell me that I'm a horrible son. Uh, they actually love the bus. It's one of those big luxury buses, and it goes from Portsmouth or uh, yeah Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and it takes them down to Logan Airport, and they don't have to worry about traffic and all that and. My dad can read whatever articles he's got on his iPad, and my mother can just complain the whole time. All right. I want you to do me a favor right now. You're in front of your browser, right? Yes. Okay. I want you to go to a brand new website from the DNC. It's taxesbytrump.com. Taxesbytrump.com. Please do it. And then when you get there, don't touch anything. Just let me know when you're there. Yep, I'm here. All right, click on C returns. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyone who's wondering why we laugh, uh, why we're laughing, absolutely has to, has to go by taxesbytrump.com. In fact, I am going to put this out on our social media right now. They just literally just sent this to the press. <clears throat> I this mean, is, uh, the, the timestamp on it is uh, 58, and we are at uh, zero, 00. So this actually got to me two minutes ago. Yeah, and it just went out on our on our Facebook, Twitter, my Twitter, my Facebook, my other Facebook, and my other Facebook. All right. It's, it's just I, I knew you would get a kick out of it, so I'm glad that I had an opportunity to do that uh, while we were doing the podcast today. Yeah, um, that, that was terrific. You know, I want to go uh, to something that you and I discussed this morning um, because it uh, kind of got in my head. You know what? Actually, before we do that, um, let's remind the audience how important it is that they support us financially and otherwise, because uh, we've made a commitment to being better marketers of the work that we do. We certainly are worthy of uh, getting an income from doing this, which we do not do right now. There are, of course, other ways for those that can't afford a donation to help us out. So why don't we do that quickly before we move on to some other stuff? Well, as you know, Tony... <laughs> should I should I should I sound like NPR? Well, no, nope, I think you should just get out there and do yeah, it. Yeah, talk dot com. It's t and a n d t n z talk dot com, and um, you can find out all the ways to promote us and share us. And and you know, I mean, yeah, money is is important. Don't get me wrong, and I'm not uh, diminishing that. We do need money, and we have a Patreon page where you can support um, and sponsor us. Uh, also sharing us and getting more people to listen because the more people we get to listen, the more we can start approaching uh, advertisers that, that we actually like. That's the one thing about podcasting that I found out about is that we, we can kind of pick and choose uh, who, who we want 
uh, to advertise on our show and agrees with our um, our basic morality and ethics. And uh, that would be nice to have. So, you know, share us, have your friends listen, f- send emails to your friends, family, your entire email list and tell them, hey, listen to these guys. I've been listening to them for a while. Uh, I really like them. And um, yeah, that's it. TNZtalk.com. So All what, right. So what so what got into your head? Well, what got into my head is that um, somebody had made a comment that uh, the show was unfocused or all over the place. Unfocused was, I think, the word you used. Um, and I take great exception to that. I think we are very focused, uh, very focused uh, in the best possible way. Uh, the core of what we do, Z, is political in nature, always will be, and that won't change. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have other interests and vices that we wouldn't talk about from time to time. And certainly the centerpiece of our discussions right now uh, are on the uh, November election, as it should be. After the election, as I have done for the better part of my career, um, there's always stuff to talk about, policy and unfortunate circumstances both uh, at home and abroad etc uh, but I, I think that this gives us an opportunity to be not necessarily a catch-all but something that is uh, I think ultimately important to a listening audience that doesn't want to hear just the beat of one drum and uh, we give them an opportunity to hear you know a bunch of uh, differing opinions on a, on a variety of topics I think that's a good thing so Whoever uh, believes that we are unfocused really doesn't, I think, know much about uh, radio or media or information gathering, etc. Well, and the th- and the thing is, is my my discussion about this too was was kind of like, well, I mean, what is it? What exactly does that mean? I mean, you know, it the the title of our show is TNZ Talk. The description is what happens when a longtime radio host and a Huffington Post blogger get together to talk about politics. And that's what we do. Right. I mean, it's like saying, well, you know, uh, I'm not going to listen to and I'm not comparing us to this, but, you know, I'm not going to listen to Rush Limbaugh because he's he's all over the place and unfocused. Well, he's got millions of listeners. Right. So really, if you think we should be more like NPR and be focused on a particular topic and uh, do nothing but that for an hour on that one topic, then uh, listen to NPR. But what we do is talk about what uh, what happened yesterday, today, uh, immediately, what's happening around us and what we feel about it. And if you have something to say and want to contribute to the conversation, one, we'd be happy to have you on. And two, uh, well, for one, you can contact us at TNZtalk.com. Uh, you can use the email form under contact or you can call us and leave us a voicemail and we'll play it on the air. And that number is 559-898-2551, which is 559-TZ-TALK-1. And leave us a voicemail, and if I don't have to do a lot of work uh, bleeping you out, <laughs> we'll, we'll play it on the next episode. Uh, fair enough. Um, <clears throat> listen, there's an article uh, uh, and on political Politico today uh, titled MSNBC's Year of Standing Up Straight. And the subhead is, it's a new push for the network away from the lean forward years. Interestingly, the picture uh, that they use, and it's a banner type picture, very large, is of Brian Williams, Chuck Todd, Rachel Maddow, Chris Matthews, and Andrea Mitchell. What do they all have in common, Z? Uh, I would hate to guess. No, you should. Uh, you should actually. Uh, you would probably guess this well, but I'll go ahead and tell you. They're all white. Yeah. And you know, even as we look at uh, Jose Balares, who does a beautiful job, we take a look at Tamron Hall, who is uh, and just an amazing uh, reporter. Um, I watch her uh, also on the forensic uh, files. Uh, uh, she just does an amazing job. I mean, she has an interesting background. Her sister was murdered, and so she, you know, started getting into uh, criminal reporting. Um, she actually uh, was a protege of Prince, which I found interesting. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's a severe lack of of uh, 
diversity on MSNBC uh, that once existed now no longer does. Uh, and there's a, a woman on the weekend, and her name's escaping me. That does a show, Joy Reid. Joy Reid, and she's, then you she's know, fantastic. By the way, she is fantastic, and she asks great questions, and she doesn't let either. Republicans, Democrats, independents, or libertarians get away with BS answers. Uh, but, you know, again, the, the lack of diversity on MSNBC is more reminiscent, and you wonder if they're modeling it after both CNN, who has seen a ratings sur- resurgence, and Fox News, which is devoid of any people of color in any way, shape, or form. I might be overgeneralizing a little bit, but I don't ever remember seeing. Uh, with the exception of Juan Williams, anybody yeah. on Fox News, seriously, uh, yeah. that's uh, that's black or Hispanic, and I could be wrong. I mean, I could. Um, MSNBC recently hired a Asian anchor, and I've seen him uh, on the weekends here and there, and he's very, very good. But uh, it seems like uh, they've kicked the diversity to the weekends, and Monday through Friday, which are the ratings days or days that matters, the days that set advertising rates, it's all white all the time. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't. It didn't really occur to me that uh, that it was it was a weekend thing. Yeah. So anyway, I just uh, didn't read the article. Interesting point, uh, Tony Trippiano. <laughs> well, thank you, Richard Zombeck. Uh, I haven't read the article. I will. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, I don't know. I, I just, uh, the year of standing up straight. Uh, if they're saying that they're more in the middle, that's a lie. They're not. Uh, all you had to do is watch last night's uh, uh, quad uh, quadfecta. Um, you know, you have, uh, we start with Chris Matthews, then uh, the guy I don't like very much, uh, Chris Hayes. And then we go into Rachel Maddow and then Lawrence O'Donnell, who is, I think, uh, next to Rachel Maddow, uh, the best thing that ever happened to MSNBC. Yeah, he's 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 excellent. And by the way, Rachel Maddow is not straight. (laughs) No kidding. (laughs) They're standing. They're standing up straight, not standing straight. Oh, okay. I got you. I got you. So what do you have against Chris Hayes? I, I just don't like him. I just don't think he does a very nice job. I don't enjoy watching him. I and and I've told you I uh, leave the show on at the beginning, and I give him five minutes. And most of the time, most of the time, I end up going to uh, again uh, the forensic fi- uh, what's it called investigative ID channel or something that I uh, DVR'd or something on Netflix. Um, I just don't find him that compelling, number one. Number two, he often gets guests that have already been on the network that day, so I already have their perspective. And I realize he doesn't produce the show. And I'm also smart enough and been around this business long enough to know he probably has no say in who's on his show. Um... Chris Hayes would be one of those people that probably makes a nice income, but not nearly what you might think. Um, He's certainly not making the money that uh, Rachel or Chris or Andrea or Chuck or Brian are. No question about that. So he comes at a reasonable price, and that's, I think, why he's there. See, I kind of like him. Well... You know, he replaced Ed Schultz, so I have a problem with that as well. I can I can understand that. That was far more dynamic and uh, much more controversial and did lean left or lean forward, as MSNBC would put it. But anyway, that that's uh, that's why I'm not a big fan of Chris Hayes. I just don't think he's all that good. And, you know, everybody's got a right to their opinion, and that's mine. Yeah. Well, and I, I got to tell you, I'm kind of glad that they got rid of Sharpton on the weekdays. Okay, I'll take the bait. Why? Just because. I I thought he was horrible. Just because. He was horrible. <laughs> I mean, horrible. <laughs> he, can't read um, a, he, he can't read a teleprompter worth, worth crap. No, he can't. Um, I, I Trust me, I... Uh, 
My my wife and I still make fun of them because we, we go the New England Patriots. <laughs> Yeah, he's butchered. Because he was talking about a football game. <laughs> the New England Patriots. Patriots, yeah. Tony. Patriots. Now, he, he's mispronounced lots of lots uh. of things. And, and, you know, it, it really, actually, what that really tells us is that he's not an everyman. Um, not that you have to be. You don't have to be an everyman or an every woman. But you should have functional knowledge or at least be able to read a teleprompter. Um, I've been on TV. I've, you know, n- not really used a teleprompter, but I've been on TV. So it's not like I don't know what's going on. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so with that said, uh, let's get to some of the <laughs> interesting things that have happened since last we talked. Um, not a whole lot has changed, as you and I discussed yesterday when we uh, talked, uh, except for, I think, one significant event yesterday where Donald Trump gave a press conference. Um, I don't even know where to begin with this conversation. Oh, uh, I do. You want me to just start it out? Absolutely. It was supposed to be a day for Donald Trump to salute the nation's veterans and highlight the $5.6 million he's raised for their causes. This is my check for a million dollars. Trump ticked off the more than 40 groups he claims are receiving donations, some in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. From the Fisher House Foundation to the Bob Woodruff Family Foundation and the Intrepid Fallen Heroes Fund. But clearly furious after months of questions about exactly where the money is going, Trump engaged in some verbal combat of his own against a target he's attacked before. You know my opinion to the media. It's very low. The news media. Instead of being like, thank you very much, Mr. Trump, or Trump did a good job, everyone say, who got it, who got it, who got it? And you make me look very bad. So Trump took aim at the reporters asking the questions. On that, you keep calling us the dishonest press. It seems as though you're resistant to scrutiny, the kind of scrutiny that comes with running for president of the United States. I like you're saying, scrutiny, but you know what? When you're I raising raise money, money for veterans. Excuse me, excuse me. I've watched you on television. You're a real beauty. What I don't want is when I raise millions of dollars, have people say like this sleazy guy right over here from ABC. He's a sleaze in my book. Trump went on to say he never wanted any credit for helping veterans' causes. But I didn't want to have credit for it. Now, actually, though, what I got was worse than credit because they were questioning me. But it was Trump who launched his fundraising drive as a major media event, rivaling a GOP debate in Iowa he was skipping. We actually raised close to six, to be totally honest. But, and, and I have to say, a lot more to come. Trump's fiery news conference was only the latest example of how the real estate tycoon treats people he doesn't like. Today he. So do you, do you want to talk about this or, do you, or should we just go right into that second clip? Uh, let's go into the second clip and then we'll talk on the other side. Yeah, I think you've set a, a new bar today for being contentious with the press corps, kind of calling us losers to our faces and all that. Is no, this no? Not all of you, just many of you. All right, fine. En- enough of us. Is, is this what not you did? Is it? Is this what it's going to be like covering yeah, you if you're is. president? Yeah, it is. is let, let me. We're going to have this kind I'm, of confrontation in the press room. Okay. Yeah, it is going to be like this, David. If the press writes false stories, like they did with this, because you know pro- half of you are amazed that I raised all of this money. If the press writes false stories like they did where I wanted to keep a low profile. I didn't want the credit for raising all this money for the vets. I wasn't looking for the credit. And by the way, more money is coming in. I wasn't looking for the credit. But I had no choice but to do this because the press was saying I didn't raise any money for them. Not only did I raise it, much of it was given a long time ago. And there is a vetting process, and I think you understand that. But when I raise almost $6 million, and probably in the end we'll raise more than six because more is going to come in and is coming in. But when I raise 5.6 million as of today, more is coming in. And, I, and, and this is going to phenomenal groups. And I have many of these people vetting the people that are getting the money and working hard. And then we have to read sto- probably libelous stories, or certainly close, in the newspapers. And the people know the stories are false. I'm going to continue to attack the press. Look, I find the press to be extremely dishonest. I find the political press to be unbelievably dishonest. I will say that. 
Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, By the way, there was a theme of that answer, and it wasn't about attacking the media. There's more coming in, Z. There's more coming in. As far as? What? We don't know. I don't know. He just uh, kept on saying there's more. I I think he meant money. But it could mean insults. I don't know. Yeah. So what? 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 How is he going to respond when the press asks him? You know, how do you respond to uh, the veterans groups that have refused your donations because they don't want to have anything to do with you, right? Or how? How about responding to why is it that many of these organizations just received checks last week after being ignored for months and months and months? Or better yet. What about some of the organizations you've given money to that, uh, by virtue of Charity Watch, claim that they are basically stealing most of the money they get in donations for, quote-unquote, administrative costs? Right. Right. I, I mean, you know, the, the, the fact that he doesn't want to be questioned is really, uh, it's disturbing <clears throat> on on a lot of different levels, uh, you know, I mean, he's basically uh, undermined. He's under. I need I need to go go back in time a little bit because to to a degree, um, there there's a there's an agreement. And I think you and I agree too that that there, there's there's a lot of the press that we could do without, right? Because they're factually incorrect. Um, there's not a lot of investigative journalism anymore, you know, whether that's because of uh, politics, uh, company politics, internal politics, or, or uh, available funds, which is, which is really the problem in, in many of these newsrooms, is that they don't want to spend the money uh, for good investigative journalism. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that his lashing out, this is the first time uh, there's always usually kind of been a, a contention uh, among the press and and politics, and rightly so, right? Because the press calls calls out politicians on their crap. But to stand there and for a politician and a politician running for president uh, to say that they all lie uh, really kind of sets things up in uh, a, a frightening way for, uh, you know, a future uh, Donald Trump presidency. Uh, I have to laugh when I say that, but um, and it, set, it sets a dangerous precedent uh, for really any presidency uh, in the future. Uh, um, sure enough, <clears throat> I, I just, again, I, I find it astounding. Uh, that he can stand in front and, and, and well, and let me ask you this. Did you see the press conference, by the way? I did. All right. You, there were a couple times where there was applause. Did the, uh, I'm assuming it wasn't just media in that room because I can't imagine the media applauding. Although, I mean, depending on the media, maybe they were. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, I mean, there was a lot of applause. I mean, it wasn't just two or three people. There was, you know, obviously distinguishable applause. Well, but I mean, there there are people there are people in the media that completely agree with him because they think it's not about them, you know. And they're saying, "Oh yeah, those other guys. Oh yeah, those those other those those it's those other news organizations that he's talking about. He's not talking about us." And so, I mean, do we even know who else was in the room that could have been applauding? No, that's why I bring it up. Right. Yeah, I don't. I don't either. All right. Well, you know, the the bottom line is this, and let me just break it down as simply as I possibly can. Donald Trump gets up in front of major media outlets in this country, uh, details how they dispersed $5.6 million to veterans organizations, gets angry that he was even questioned about it. Uh, We know for a fact that he was basically forced into doing it, especially writing his own personal check for a million dollars, which he didn't want to do. And by the way, there's still not been a confirmation that that check is cleared. And I don't mean that that the check is good. 
whether it was actually applied. Uh, so there's that question, having a copy of a check and actually having that check deposited into an account are two very different things. I could write a check for a million dollars. It wouldn't matter, um, is my point. Now, with that said, we also learned that, again, some of the veterans groups he gave to, by the way, are very, very obscure. Others are better known. Some of them are under scrutiny. We also learned that, again, many of them only got money uh, last week, and some of them, in the bigger picture, percentage-wise, got a paltry amount of money. So I don't know, and he didn't explain how that money was dispersed by dollar figures. So we don't know why some got 150000 while others got 50000 We just don't know. On top of that, Z... One of the groups that he mentioned, he said, didn't get their money yet because they hadn't been completely vetted. This is the real zinger. Because the IRS form that they have to file uh, hadn't been received yet. So it's okay for Donald Trump to have standards that requires an outside entity to prove its tax status, but it's not incumbent upon him to provide tax returns, which is the same thing he's asking of this organization. Well, but that that, makes, that is the very definition of hypocrisy, is it not? Well, doesn't that doesn't that make sense though? I want to know no. what you're doing with I want to I want I want to know what you're doing with my money, but you have no business knowing what I do with mine. Like I said, is that not the very definition of hypocrisy? Well, yes. Okay, well, no, I mean, listen, there are people listening to us that just don't freaking get that. <laughs> oh, come on, you know it's true. I know it's true. I know it's true. Oh, my God. I know. Well, I mean, listen, this is the thing, right, is that no matter what he does, his his followers, his minions are are going to find a way to excuse it, Right. It's like, well, I mean, he lied. Well, yeah, but he has to lie, and everyone lies. Well, but how is that an excuse? Well, I mean, come on, Hillary lies all the time. It's like, no, we're talking. Let's let's put Hillary lies all the time over here, and let's just talk about Donald Trump because he's the one that you want for president. So he lies all the time, and you're willing to vote for him because he lies just as much as Hillary. And you don't want her as pre- so. Where can you please make sense of this for me? Can you please explain that to me? How how are you even able to walk around in society and not get hit by a truck? Yeah. Well, again, uh, it, it it really is. Uh, At some level, there's a sense of logic, but that's where I get concerned because logic seems to be lost in a conversation uh, that is not based in reality any longer. And I am very afraid of that. And when we talk, as we do on this show, uh, about the reality of a Donald Trump victory in November, this is the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night, and I'm not joking. I wish I were joking. I actually worry about this crap more than I should. About Donald Trump becoming president? <laughs> yes. Follow that bouncing ball, Richard Trump. <laughs> are, are you worried about the construction crew outside? I know. This, it doesn't matter. It's it's live. It doesn't matter. I don't care about that stuff. The audience doesn't care about that stuff. Um, I don't know. I'm just, uh, you know, at some level I get very discouraged, and I, uh, I'm i just trying to work my way through some of this. Um, well, you know, let's, uh, <laughs> let's stay on this just a little bit longer. Dana Bash, who is somebody that I actually spent a day with uh, a few years back, as I led an effort here in Michigan when we had an open primary to get Rick Santorum a primary victory in Michigan over Mitt Romney and almost accomplished my goal. 
Uh, now it's my turn. Somebody's, I think, cutting down a tree. Um, with that said, uh, she had a few choice words uh, for what Donald Trump did yesterday to the media. Let's listen to that. A choice. I think the headline at the end of this event wasn't the money he raised or how many groups got it, but it was just how petulant and peevish he was, saying the press should be ashamed of itself for asking questions like, how much did you raise and where did it go? Want to go On to CNN's? a factual basis, those are pretty simple questions you should answer when you're raising money, when you're raising money for charity. Not doling tough questions. CNN chief political correspondent Dana Bash joins us right now. He attacked our reporter Jim Acosta. Dana, he attacked Tom Yamas of ABC News, calling him sleazy again for asking questions like, how much did you raise and where did it go? Uh, you know, I'm... Uh, I pride myself, as we all do, as, on being dispassionate. But this is a, a situation where I don't think we should be dispassionate. And the reason is because, just, let's just take a step back to where we were and where you guys were in New York leading into this press conference. It was Drew Griffin who was one of the people who not only asked the questions about where this money is, was going or how much was raised by Donald Trump, but go back a year plus, he was the one who exposed the problems in the VA in the first place, a member of the press corps. Uh, that was going to be, we all thought, the story of the day. A good news story for Donald Trump that, yes, as, as Drew Griffin said, it was bumpy. It wasn't necessarily the cleanest way to do it. But at the end of the day, he raised almost six million dollars for veterans groups. Instead, what did he do? He attacked uh, the press, as you said, uh, as, as sleazy, as dishonest multiple times. And, you know, not to get too, uh, too corny about it, but it is the press. Number one, it is our job to ask questions, particularly of public figures, especially somebody who wants to be the leader of the free world. When they make a promise and they do it in a very public way, like he did with this big rally for veterans, to say, it is our job to say, where's the money? Where did it go? How much did you raise? It is a fundamental requirement and responsibility of a free press. It's what makes us different than North Korea or other places. And he hasn't had to answer questions like this in his prior life. He's been a public figure for decades, and he hasn't had to answer questions because uh, he's been a public figure in the, in the press, if you will, but he's been a private citizen. It's a different ball game now, and so it is up to us to ask the questions. And I think it's because people like Drew Griffin and others were asking questions about where this money is going that these veterans groups were able to get this money. And he was able to give all of these big dollar amounts to all of these fabulous organizations. So I think we should just be clear here that the press is a very easy target. I get it. We all get it. We all understand uh, why. And, uh, and it's understandable why he's doing that. But in this particular case, he is somebody who is, who's got to be ready to take questions. And on this particular issue, the press did its job and did it pretty well. Good for her. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, and, you know, she's right. I think the press does an excellent job of trying to stay dispassionate. Now, with that said, that doesn't mean that every news outlet or every pundit agrees with what Dana Bass just had to say. And in fact, on Fox, well, on Fox News, what we would expect to have happen. See, we'll let this audio speak for itself. Donald Trump, the presumptive Republican nominee, uh, delivering a news conference there at Trump Tower uh, in New York City, outlining the $5.6 million, he says, that he raised for veterans groups, a million of it, uh, he says, donated by him personally. Rejoining us once again, the two uh, columnists who were, well, our, uh, our conversation with them was interrupted when the Trump event began. A.B. Stoddard is associate editor and columnist at The Hill. Charlie Hurt, columnist at The Washington Times. What stands out for each of you from that uh, news conference? A.B., to you first. Well, I think um, you're going to see a lot written about he um, is not going to change, he doesn't want to change, um, that he's being criticized for not uniting behind the Republican Party and criticizing people who are his critics. But I think he probably ended the um, 
controversy over raising money for veterans and then the money not making to the groups. For months, there were questions to the campaign about which groups had received them and there were no answers and became sort of an ongoing story. It was Trump admitting last week he hadn't yet given his own million. He put it to rest. He gave all the amounts, all the organizations, and I think that, you know, he said he's done this big thing, and I think that that's the end of that story. D did he put the questions to rest, Charlie? Yeah, I mean, and this is vintage Donald Trump, what we've seen, uh, you know, for the past 11 months uh, or, or 12 months now. It's, uh, you know, what started a, as a scandal, what started as, you know, the New York, uh, the, the Washington Post uh, had a story uh, last week talking about, how, you know, raising all these questions about the money and, and how much was raised and whether it was given and all this kind of stuff. And Donald Trump just takes it and he, and he makes a big spectacle out of it. He holds a big press conference and he takes on the media. And, and you know, attacking the media you, is never a bad idea for a politician. And he does it and he does it brilliantly and he does it uh, forcefully. And he does it in a way that makes people sit, sitting at home cheer because they, because they share so much of that disdain for the media. And uh, it's just amazing to watch. And, and, and as A.B. said, I think he did. He put a lot of all those questions to, to bed. And then not only that, had a, you know, 40 minute press conference where he was able to, to showcase his uh, devotion to the vets and uh, his charity uh, uh, to, to the vet, veteran organizations. Somewhere I can hear Spiro Agnew applauding that performance. <laughs> Charlie Hurt, A.B. Stoddard. Thank you both. Thanks, John. Well, that, that, that wasn't too sanctimonious. No, not too. Uh, you know, and again, it's just, um, well, you know, what you reap, you're, you sow, right? Um, and so Donald Trump got a de facto endorsement yesterday from a foreign <laughs> entity. Oh, don't laugh yet. You're going to ruin it. Um well, again, I don't want to spoil it for the audience. So let's let's play that audio so people can see that foreign governments are taking Donald Trump seriously, number one. And number two, some actually like him. You've got to hand it to Donald Trump. What other American candidate gets a vote of confidence from North Korea? A country that releases a video showing its missiles striking Washington now publishes an editorial in a state media outlet calling the Donald a wise politician, a far-sighted presidential candidate, and advising Americans not to vote for that dull Hillary. Trump, at least, has said he'd talk to North Korea. As Korea expert John Pfeffer put it, I would have to say that Donald Trump is the Dennis Rodman of American politics. Prone to shake things up and make outlandish statements. Well, maybe not as outlandish as when Rodman praised Kim Jong-un. He's a great guy. He's just a great guy. A great guy who puts 200,000 people in prison camps? Well, you know, and guess what? It's amazing how we do the same thing here. North Korean high five! The Donald's not high-fiving Kim Jong-un anytime soon. <laughs> He's like a maniac. OK, and you got to give him credit. How many young guys take over these tough generals? It's incredible. He wiped out the uncle. And speaking of wiping out, I would get China to make that guy disappear in one form or another very quickly. And let me tell you, people How do you say, make oh, him disappear and assassinate him? Let me just tell you. Okay. No, well, you know, I've heard of worse things, frankly. I mean, this guy's a bad dude. But the one thing Trump and North Korea's leader do share flamboyant hair. At least for the time being, the meeting of the two greatest adult male hairdos in the world will not take place. <laughs> That's it, but Kim Jong-un doesn't have time to meet with Donald Trump. He's too busy making North Korea great again. <laughs> Kim Jong-un has been photoshopped with Trump's hair, but at least we're not talking about little hands. We're talking about shaking not-so-little hair hands. Genie Mo, CNN. Ah, you gotta love Genie Mo, CNN. Um, <laughs> really well done piece, obviously tongue in cheek, kind of, kind of, kind, kind of, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, Tony, I, I, I have no idea what to, I was actually very surprised in, in one of the previous, uh, one of the previous, uh, uh, audios there, uh, and was surprised when I heard it on TV as well, that there, the press is actually calling, uh, Donald Trump petulant uh, for once. 
not uh, not constantly calling uh, Barack Obama petulant. I find that to be a very demeaning term, uh, but uh, but I completely approve of it when it's used for Donald Trump. All right, one more piece of Donald Trump uh, audio, and then we'll move on to some other topics, including. Bernie Sanders, a great story that I found that's actually Boston-based that we'll get to. And uh, Elizabeth Warren and organized labor working together. But until we uh, until we get through this, uh, my girlfriend, Donald Trump's spokesperson, <laughs> uh, uh, was on CNN as well. And as many of you know, Donald Trump has been heavily criticizing the federal judge, who is an American citizen, uh, for the way he's handled the Trump University lawsuit, which uh, may explode on Donald Trump. Whether or not it matters or not, we'll figure, find out soon enough. But anyway, his spokesperson was on CNN. That's Donald Trump's. And this is how that exchange went. As you know, there have been questions about Trump University and people, uh, journalists and as well as people who went there think that it has some dubious claims that have been made. So the Washington Post has been looking to get its hands on documents that could see if Trump University overpromised its students. So now the judge connected to the case, um, Mr. Trump has been going after that judge in a sort of interesting way. Let me play for you what he said this weekend. But I have a judge who is a hater of Donald Trump, a hater. He's a hater. His name is Gonzalo Curiel, the judge who happens to be, we believe, Mexican, which is great. I think that's fine. You know what? I think the Mexicans are going to end up loving Donald Trump when I give all these jobs. So, Katrina, we believe he's Mexican. What is that? Well, I think there's two parts uh, to this, Allison. First, you know, Trump University, uh, we're, we're classes being taught to people. And it's like saying that if you graduated from Harvard and you don't have the same outcome in your profession as everyone else, then you should sue Harvard. And that's just simply absurd. Well, not exactly. I mean, a lot of the students said that they were overpromised, that, that all sorts of things were overpromised, that Donald Trump was going to be playing more of an active role than he was, that there was more of a um, job uh, a rate of job success than really was true. I mean, there are many things that people right. Take that's, issue that's with. my point. The outcomes. They wanted the equal outcome, equal outcomes, and you just can't guarantee an outcome. And some of these people who were a part of this case have already given a glowing review of Trump University. So this will play out. With regards to this judge, however, there was supposed to be a hearing last summer, and this judge postponed it for whatever reason. But I think what's really interesting about this particular judge, as Mr. Trump refers to him as a Trump hater, is he even mentions on his judicial question that he was a La Raza Lawyers Association member. This is an organization that has been out there organizing these anti-Trump protesters mm -hmm. with the Mexican flags. They are pushing it. These signs have been very apparent. And so oh. Mr. Trump is just stating the obvious. But, but this judge isn't Mexican. He was born here. He's American. No, I'm not saying he's Mexican. What I'm saying is the reason he's right, pointing this Mr. out Trump is because La Raza is tied to. But why is Mr. Trump saying he says we believe. he's Mexican? He says we believe. But what's the point of that? Why is he going after an ethnicity? What's the point? Well, it's because what we see outside of these rallies, these anti-Trump rallies, these, these criminal rallies, these criminal protesters who are out there defacing property and attacking police officers, doing so under the guise of, of an anti-Trump protest with their Mexican flags and La Raza. And mm -hmm. this judge is connected to that. OK, but you recognize that the judge you're saying that Mr. Trump was wrong, that you recognize that the judge. No, I don't not. know if he's Mexican or not. I don't know if he's Mexican or not. I don't know his heritage or his descent. The point here is we keep talking about these these anti-Trump protests and we need to identify who these people are and, and what they're doing, because this is not a mm -hmm. pro-American group who is out there wanting to, to yep. hear, get their voices heard. They are out there pushing to destroy, propose anarchy yep. to stop an American president from, from running for office. Okay, for the record, he's American, but we hear you, Katrina. Thank you for being on New Day. We appreciate it. Thanks, Allison. Oh, Katrina, you're so much prettier when you don't talk. <laughs> And she, I know that sounds very sexist, but it's true. She just has the probably the hardest job in the world right now. Uh, not a, not to her. I think she's just uh, this is her 15 minutes. I mean, really, 
I mean, defending Donald Trump? It's her 15 minutes. It's about her ego. It's not about reality. It's not about what comes next. Um, she's delusional enough to think Donald Trump's going to win. Uh, well, maybe she's not that delusional, and she'll end up with a job. Can you imagine her as uh, the press secretary giving a briefing? Oh, my God, Tony. I mean, that's what scares me. I mean, she, the spin that she's capable of is just absolutely – I mean, it's masterful. But really? she's no, she's really bad at it. It's not masterful. When she says, "I don't know what his heritage is," well, but oh the, come on, yeah, yeah. But the, but the thing is, is it's like I mean, you got to give her credit for thinking on her feet. You know, she's at least given it. She's given it the old college try there. Uh, you know, despite the fact that she was involved in some kind of uh, 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 welfare ripoff. Um, <laughs> you know, I saw the mug shots. She wasn't that pretty. Um, no one's ever pretty in their mind. I, I always think of Tom DeLay when he was booked, uh, where he had this big, big smile on his face, like, I couldn't be happier to be here. Yeah, or uh, governor of Texas there. Um, Rick Perry. Rick Perry, his mugshot. Yeah. Remember that one? <laughs> it, looked, but, it looked like a, it looked like I mean, a Match.com picture. Well, I, I realize that, you know, most people, when they have their mug shots are, you know, it's the middle of the night. Uh, they were just, uh, you know, the, the, the transported from point A to point B, uh, not under their own power, etc. cetera. Um, so, yeah, you have a tendency uh, not to look that good, not to mention the fact that you're really pissed off. And so that doesn't help. So when you do see those mug shots of people looking happy and jolly, like they just came back from a uh, glamour shots uh, photo shoot, you got to wonder what they have in their underwear. <laughs> that was okay. That was, that was, that was just an, saying. That, that was an interesting twist. I, hey, just saying. I All mean, right. So you know, we've got. Go well, ahead. We, so, we so got wait. two minutes left, and there's lots of stuff I want to get to. Yeah, and there's stuff that we can get to tomorrow too. But you know, you don't want to get to it tomorrow. There, Maybe there, there will be other stuff tomorrow. There's there's a quote. Yeah, we'll, we'll get some more Trump uh, audio. There's um there's a quote that was uh, has been attributed to both Mark Twain and to Getty, um, but. The quote is, uh, don't argue with, and, you know, of course, this, this is old timey stuff. So I'll, it's the, the quote is man, but I'll use person. Don't argue with a person who buys his ink by the barrel and his paper by the ton. Right. Right. And, um, you know, you've got Fox News that's basically lauding, uh, Donald Trump for his coming out after the press because they think, that uh, they're immune from it because he's he's a quote unquote Republican, and you've got him coming out after judges, after judges, Tony, which is probably one of the stupidest things you could possibly do. Which, well, let's let's go back just a few days where he was giving a speech at a rally, and he started railing against this judge and getting into specifics, and the audience members started pulling out their cell phones. And making calls and texting and literally playing video games while Donald Trump was uh, just meandering over this lawsuit. They didn't care. Right. But what the judge did also, whether or not it has anything to do with Donald Trump's comments, is he released everything about the case. And it was basically, yeah, he, here you go. Have a look for yourself. Right. Um well, again, we'll see, you know, what damage has been done uh, or it will be done. I, I do know the little I have heard. I've not read that. I've not read them. Uh, but it's my understanding that the damage uh, that may be done is there are some that said that they were coerced into spending up to $35,000 for promises not made. Now, let me just very quickly tell you a story so we can get on to some other stuff. A couple years ago, I was at a conference. I was out of town at a conference. And there was this huge line in this hotel. 
So I asked somebody standing in line, what's going on? I thought there was a celebrity there. Well, there was, right? That celebrity was Donald Trump. I thought, wow, that's really cool. You know, The Apprentice and uh, this guy George that used to be on with him, his right-hand man, was supposedly there in Ivanka. Um, so I understood the, the line and wh- how long it was. And it was long, Z. I mean, it was really, really long. And so I said, uh, why is everybody standing in line to get into the seminar or something? Oh, no, the seminar's not for a couple hours. Uh, it's to get your picture taken. You know, if you paid X amount of dollars, you got your picture taken with Donald Trump and George and Ivanka. You ready for this? They were cardboard cutouts that you got your picture taken with. Ugh. And people were pissed. Now it gets better. Donald Trump was supposed to be there and canceled at the last minute. And this was all for Trump University. Wow. And when I say the line was long, I mean astronomical. Anyway, Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton are close to a virtual dead heat, excuse me, in California. Uh, Hillary uh, canceled all events in New Jersey, which is a pretty safe thing to do because she's well ahead there to travel back to California to uh, try to drum up more votes. And it may work. Um, She's got a much bigger operation there, is spending a lot more money there, has a bigger and more vast phone banking uh, center there, not to mention the fact that she has a variety of celebrities that speak a variety of foreign languages. And as you know, California really is a melting pot for many different cultures. So she may have an advantage there. But that's not to say that Bernie isn't performing extremely well. And, uh, well, you know, he talked climate change, which was a nice, a uh, little bit of a nice change of pace for him. Uh, because I, uh, I, I was watching this little vignette, and I didn't grab the audio because I just didn't, um, of the message that he can, and we played the ad last week, but the message he continues to deliver about income inequality. And there was an interesting, uh, a reporter did an interesting kind of man on the street interview uh, with Californians from all walks of life on both sides of the aisle and in the independent center. And that message isn't really resonating with Californians. I don't know why, but it's not. Anyway, uh, Bernie's talking a little climate change. Maybe it'll make a difference, see? Mm, maybe. Well, in a, in, in a state that has experienced five straight years of drought, I think climate change is probably a message they'll understand. Well, I agree with you. But also they've got uh, Jerry Brown, who was at war with the Clintons for many years, who just uh, endorsed Hillary Clinton. Right. Well, anyway, let's listen to uh, let's listen to that slice of audio you have on Bernie and climate change. I am a member of the U.S. Senate Committee on the Environment, and in that capacity, I have talked to scientists all over this country and all over the world. Now, I recognize that all of the scientists who have studied this issue for decades are not quite as smart as Donald Trump. I got that. Because I know that Donald Trump, after years of intensive study, has concluded that there is no drought in California. And and Donald Trump, even after more years of study, has concluded that climate change is a hoax. See, now, I was not shocked to hear that uh, Trump thought climate change was a hoax. That's what most Republicans think. Pretty pathetic, but that is what they think. But what I was surprised about is he thought it was a hoax perpetrated on our country by the Chinese. See, and I thought he would have... He would have believed it was a hoax created by the Mexicans or the Muslims. Why the Chinese? I don't know. 
But in any case, despite Donald Trump's profound thought on this issue, what virtually the entire scientific community understands is climate change is real. Climate change is caused by human activity. Climate change is already causing devastating problems, as you well know, in California, here in this country and all over the world. And here is what is really scary, and we had better listen to them. What the scientists are also telling us, if we do not get our act together boldly and in the very short future, what we're going to be seeing is more drought, more flooding, more extreme weather disturbances, more acidification of the ocean, more rising sea levels, and more international conflict as people around the world fight over limited natural resources. We have a moral responsibility as custodians of this planet to make sure that we leave this planet in a way that is healthy for our kids. All right. Now, I get it's interesting because uh, when Donald Trump was talking about there not being a drought, that the Obama administration was keeping water from the farmers. And by the way, Donald Trump loves the farmers. <laughs> Just like he loves the vets. He loves everybody. And the but Mexicans. He loves the farmers. And, and women. When he's a, and when he's elected president, he's going to give the farmers the water the Obama administration is keeping from them. Well, he's going to open it up, going to open up the Don't, water. Don't know where the water's being hidden, but he's going to do that. Anyway, that's Bernie's message. Very quickly, we only have a couple minutes left. The story out of Boston I mentioned, uh, there was a woman uh, who was a quote-unquote burlesque dancer from Seattle, was boarding an airplane the uh, day before yesterday, and the uh, crew asked her if she would change her clothes because the shorts she were wearing were, well, frankly, too short. Is there such a thing, Z, and did they have a right to ask her to cover her buns? Well, they did kind of look like granny panties. No, I'm just saying, you know, did they, uh, you know, is there a dress code to get on an airplane? I think that if they have one, it should be stated ahead of time. Okay. Well, I thought they were harassing her a little bit. I thought they, I thought they were, too. And if they do, in fact, have have a dress code, it should it should be uh, at least in their contract somewhere. Uh, I don't think just because, you know, you can't just tell someone, look, I don't like the clothes you're wearing, um, you know, because I'm sure they'd allow, you know, uh, a thinner, prettier um, Hooters girl on the plane. If she was wearing uh, Daisy Duke shorts, uh, they probably wouldn't have a problem with that. Uh, well, they may, they may, but the point is, and I'll I'll use a different example. It, it's no to me, it's no different than telling somebody that's fat that they can't sit in a seat, uh, which has happened. Um, you know, people are heavy, and so be it. Uh, people wear short shorts, so be it. Um, Man, oh, man, uh, I just thought it was a little inappropriate. Anyway, we're out of time. Let's remind people, Richard Zombeck, one more time. How do they send money? That's the thing that matters most to me. How do they send money? They can go to tnztalk.com and click on support, and there's a whole list of ways that you can support us. tnztalk.com. You'll also find our Facebook page, Twitter page, and numerous ways that you can subscribe to us if you want updates uh subscribe to our newsletter it's under the subscribe tab absolutely all right that'll do it for us for today as we're just out of time we'll be back uh tomorrow in the meantime if you'd like to make a comment pick up the phone and dial 559-898-2551. That's 559-898-2551 or 559-TZ-TALK-1. We are out of here for today. And as always, we ask that you be well. Oh, yeah. Can you feel it? Just over the credits, just riffing now. Words and chords. Not the poetry and the real thing, but not bad for an ad lib. Not good, but. And 
it's not long enough, so just do a little bit more. And that's nearly done. That's the final credit there. That's the end. <coughs>